Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. Well, it's official, people. I retired. I said, well, hasta la vista down here in South Florida. Of course, I'm probably going to have to get another job, but that's okay. Well, just to, that's just my update. This Bible study is, well, it's going to kind of be a Bible study uh, and about finding and picking a Christian mate, spouse, and it could apply for friends too. So, and uh, when it comes to doing things wrong, I'm an expert, believe me, I am. Now, guys have a terrible habit of picking girls for their looks. And girls have a terrible habit of picking guys for their uh, bank account and wallet. And that does not... So when a guy marries a, a girl for her looks and a girl marries a guy for his bank account and money, um, that's not exactly a match made in heaven. And I've heard it said... Um, somebody said it to me. Guys marry a girl hoping that they never change, but they do. And then girls marry guys hoping that they will change, and they don't. You know, generally, if you, if you marry somebody and they're a certain way, don't expect them to change. Girls, don't think you're going to make your guy better by changing him. I mean, that's like basically saying, well, you know, I bought an old used car and I got to repaint it and you know, fix it up before it's acceptable. No. I mean, you know, you knew what you were getting into before you said, I do. And ideally, the Lord's plan was for a man and a woman to both be virgins on their wedding night. And uh, that's just not happening anymore. I mean, let's face it, the average uh, guy's a whoremonger. And I was, I was in that crowd for a while. And the average girl, by the time she graduates from high school, has probably had over a dozen different guys. You know, how many girls graduate from college now still virgins? That just, that just ain't happening in the United States. It might have been, uh, it was probably normal in the 1800s, but not nowadays, that's for sure. And, uh. How, you know, there's a certain spiritual bonding. There's a certain type of bonding a girl has uh, to her first. You know, and, you know, it's just that that was the way that uh, God's plan was, you know. When I was a very, very young uh, believer in Christ, I knew a girl named Krista. And if she ever hears this, my apologies. I was a very new Christian back then. And uh, she she lived in Denver. I lived there for a couple of years. Actually, Aurora, suburb of Denver. And, you know, she was a high school girl, you know. And, and she says, well, if I get married, I want to meet, I, I want to marry a guy that loves Jesus more than anybody else in the world. And that struck me, you know, and I realized that's some good advice. Find somebody that loves Jesus more than anything else in the world. You know, sometimes being number two isn't all that bad, you know. I mean, if they put the Lord first in their life and they marry you, uh, they're not going to cheat on you to, you know, they're not going to do that because, well, for one, they love you, and for two, they don't want to offend the Lord. And, um, you know, what can I tell you? That's that's just good advice. So, what does the Bible say about that? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. 
You know, in Matthew 22, verse 36, somebody asked Jesus, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And that word master, that's what, that's what rabbi means, master. Okay? I know they'll tell you it means teacher, mm, master. So they asked him, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said unto them, unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. He quoted Deuteronomy. And let's face it, Jesus was the lawgiver. So he says, Matthew 22, uh, verse 38, This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You want to be a Torah keeper? Love the Lord, love thy neighbor. Boom. So, nothing about keeping the Sabbath, nothing about feast days or, you know, wearing blue on your clothes or tassels or any of that stuff. I mean, that's basically that and faith. So, find somebody that loves the Lord, find somebody that loves the neighbor. Can't go wrong, right? In Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. Serving the Lord. How can you go wrong doing that, right? Uh, let's see. Now, here's an interesting thing. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 16, and then we're going to read 20. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. Not addition, multipl multiplication. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Verse 20. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Well, guess what? Israel didn't love the Lord. They didn't obey his voice. They didn't cleave unto him. And they were, they were kicked out of the land. Matter of fact, Israel was taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And they never returned. And they call them the lost tribes of, the, of Israel. Now, Abraham was the grandfather to Jacob, who his name was changed to. To Israel. And then his son was Isaac. Well, Abraham had two sons. Ishmael, which is the father of probably some of the Arabs, and then Isaac. But God confirmed his God did a covenant with Abraham, confirmed it with Isaac, and then Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And God confirmed the covenant with Jacob and changed his name to Israel. And then eventually, in the days of King David's grandson, Israel and Judah were divided. Two different land areas, two different capitals, different kings. And then northern Israel was taken into captivity 
like I said, by the Assyrians. And then when the Assyrian Empire collapsed, Israel never returned to the land. The Assyrians were a people, when they conquered you, they moved you away from where you used to live and moved to different people that they'd conquered into your area. This way you didn't know where you were and you didn't know where you were going. And they wouldn't allow you to speak your language so that you couldn't conspire against them. They wanted you to speak their language. So Israel no longer spoke Hebrew. Matter of fact, if you spoke Hebrew and you were an Israelite and you were living in the Assyria, they caught you speaking Hebrew, they'd kill you. So they lost it. And then they went and scattered. So, you know, and it says, That thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord God sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Well, they didn't love the Lord. They didn't obey his voice. And they didn't dwell in the land. They were removed. And one of my favorite writings of Paul, the book of Galatians. I've quoted this so many times. Galatians 3, 26, 27, 29, and 29. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Love the Lord? Well, I'm going to let you know a little secret. Jesus Christ is Lord. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Tell that to the Zionist churches that put people that call themselves Jews on a pedestal. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor free male. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Do you belong to Christ? The Bible says you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's what I read here. and I mean, I'm not an English major. I only took English for, you know, two years in college. You know, what can I tell you? But I think a high schooler could understand this. Doesn't say anything about spiritual, does it? No. Like the churches want you to believe. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, the Bible warns, Paul, Paul warns. This is the one that the, the Hebrew roots people and the Torah keepers want you think want you to think that Paul's a false apostle. But he warns, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Yeah, I told you um, that I'm an expert on doing things wrong. Believe me, I am a very thoroughly appointed expert on doing things wrong. So, you know, there's a difference between being with somebody, uh, let's say you were both unbelievers when you got married, okay? And then you came to the Lord. You know, there's a there's a difference between somebody saying, well, you know, I, I really don't believe the Bible, you know, I just, I've never seen any proof in it. There's a difference between that and somebody that says, like in a synagogue, that says, no, Jesus is not the Christ. He is not the Messiah. He's a false prophet. He's a fake. There's a big difference between those two things. One is being an unbeliever. The second is being an anti-Christ. Now, what does the Bible say about being yoked with somebody that hates the Lord or is an antichrist? Well, I've read this verse a lot, too. 2 Chronicles 19 and verse 2. Let me give you a quick little background. There was a good king of Judah named Jehoshaphat, 
and he helped was helping a King Ahab, who was basically a Satanist. No, he wasn't basically a Satanist. He was a Satanist. He loved Satan. He loved murder. He loved theft. He loved everything that God the Father hates, and he hated everything God the Father loved. So, what did King, the good king who was yoking himself with the bad king and said, oh, I'm going to help you in your war. People that God had sent against the bad king. And the good king says, well, I'll help you fight uh, the people that the, you know, basically the Lord sent against you. So basically the good king's fighting against the Lord's, uh, the Lord, uh, the people that the Lord had sent against the bad king. I hope that makes sense. The Lord had sent an army against the bad king, and the good king was going to help fight those people that the Lord had sent. Just remember, remember this: the powers that be are ordained of God. The reason Bill Clinton got elected: the powers that be are ordained of God. Why did Obama get elected? powers that be are ordained of God. Why did Caesar Augustus get, uh, you know, become Caesar of Rome? The powers that be are ordained of God. Same thing can be said of Hitler, Stalin, Maltese tongue, the powers that be. So, so there was a, um, a seer was an old term for a prophet. So let's read 2 Chronicles 19 and verse 2. And Jehu, the son of Hanai, the seer, a prophet, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, good King Jehoshaphat, and he asked him this question, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and help them that hate the Lord? Ooh, that's a good question. Should we be helping the ungodly and love those people that hate the Lord? Hmm. Well, is Jesus Christ Lord? Does your church help the ungodly and those that hate the Lord Jesus Christ? Hmm. Let's continue what he said. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath, anger, therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Well, guess what? Good King Jehoshaphat was, he, he was told he was going to die. And he was. He was killed in the battle because he didn't listen to this, this prophet, the seer. So, you know, there's a difference between two unbelievers getting married. One of them gets saved and then the other gets saved. You know, as opposed to somebody that actually hates and denies Jesus Christ. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, contact your local synagogue and ask them their honest opinion. They'll tell you. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Okay, now... If you want to serve the Lord and remain unmarried, that's perfectly great in the eyes of the Lord. But let's face it. Eve was created from the side of Adam to be a helpmate unto him. I mean, God even said it's not good for man to live alone. But if you want to serve the Lord and be single, well, he's that's good. Verse 2, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto his wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto her husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. 
In other words, uh, and, and women are especially bad about this. They get mad at you and then they say, oh, you don't touch me. Until, until I get what I want, you, you're not going to have sex. Forget about it. And I tell you what, I have seen so many times that happen. And then that, uh, that not so good looking girl at the office that works full time and goes to college that, you know, doesn't have time for a boyfriend. You know, guess what? Uh, you know, the not so good looking one that doesn't have a lot of guys chasing her. She might one day decide, hey, uh, your husband might just be uh, what she was looking for for, an, uh, you know, a, a time or two, you know, or whatever. But I tell you what, I've seen a, a lot of women cut their husbands off. And I'm telling you, in, in the eyes of a, of a guy, when the wife says no, they're basically telling the husband, well, it's over. Yeah, believe it or not, in the eyes of most guys, when the wife cuts them off or the girlfriend or whatever, that's basically, it, they don't consider, it, when they go with somebody else, they don't consider that cheating. Cheating is when you turn down your wife to go to be with somebody else. But when the wife doesn't want you to touch her anymore, it's not cheating in the eyes of most people. Now, in the eyes of the Lord, it's cheating. But... Um, you know, that's the thing. So a wife's not supposed to deny a wife. A husband's not supposed to deny the wife, and the wife's not supposed to do, deny the husband. And I'll tell you what, I've known guys that had beautiful-looking wives and ugly girlfriends on the side. And I'd ask them, well, your wife's gorgeous. What, what are you messing with that thing for, you know? Oh, well, she'll do a lot of things a wife won't, when the wife won't, if you catch my drift. All right, verse 5. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Sempton tempt you not for your incontinency. So, in other words... You both have to agree to abstain from sex for fasting and prayer, you know. Verse 6, but I speak this by permission and not by, and not of commandment. For I would that all men, even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. And I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them to, uh, if they abide, even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is very better to marry than to burn. Now, here's some good advice. And unto the Mary I command, yet not I, but the Lord. See, the other thing he said, that was just like Paul speaking. But now this is from the Lord. And unto the Mary I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let the, not the husband put away, or divorce, and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest, speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So if you got somebody that's, you know, got an unbelieving wife, and she's happy to live with you, and you're happy to live with her, don't divorce her. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Boy, I've seen that a lot of times. I've seen new Christian wives... One of my dad's friends gave me a Bible. She got, went to church, and I don't know if she was saved or not, but she got all excited about the Bible and Jesus and church, and her husband didn't believe, and she's like, well, why am I, you know, she tried to get her 
husband interested. I don't know. It just wasn't his time, or maybe he'd never believe. But she ended up divorcing him to marry some guy in the church. It's like, really? And my dad, it, that just ruined, ruined him about uh, churches. I mean, the, the pastor should have put a stop to that, or at least told them, called him out publicly and says, no, 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 don't do this. I, you know, it's just, what can I tell you? And if the woman which hath an husband that believe not, and if she be pleased to dwell with her, let her not, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or thou, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shall save thy wife? But as called hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. Good advice, huh? So, find somebody that loves the Lord. Find somebody that's kind. K-I-N-D, as in gentle. Well, let's take a look. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 31, and uh, for those of you that don't know it, Ephesus was a city in Greece. We read the following. Paul, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another. Be kind to each other, right? Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You ever heard that expression, for Christ's sake? People use it as a bad expression, but it's right there. For Christ's sake, hath forgiven you, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Oh, yeah. You know, that's the thing. If somebody is loves the Lord and they show the fruits of the Spirit and they're kind. Matter of fact, let's take a look at the fruits of the Spirit. Here's an excellent verse. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor of preferring one another. You know, you ever heard of Philadelphia being called uh, the city of brotherly love? Well, it's anything but today. But it comes from a Greek word, phileo, which is love. And you've heard of agape, that also means love. And they tell you, well, you know, it's just uh, different levels of love. I don't know how true that is. Um, when you look through the Bible and you look for the words meaning love, I, I think it's just um, basically synonyms. I mean, it's like, okay, for example, the Eskimos in Alaska, do you know they have like a dozen different words to describe snow? You got dry, light, flaky snow. You got heavy, wet snow. You got, uh, I don't know, white snow, darker snow, 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 snow. I don't know. They've got tons of words to describe snow because guess what? They get a lot of snow. In Colossians 3.12, it says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, 
humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Ooh. In Second Peter chapter one and verse seven, and the Torah keepers and Hebrew roots people will tell you that Second Peter is a fake book, doesn't belong in the Bible. But it says, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. And that word charity, sometimes it's translated charity, sometimes it's translated as love. Because if you have love, you will have charity. You will give to the poor and unfortunate. And that's what, that's what love is, charity. Charity is love and love is charity. Uh, you can say you love somebody all you want, but when you don't, opening your hands and giving them something, that's proof of that love. Otherwise, just saying, oh, well, I love them, that's, I mean, any politician can say, oh, I love my people, but then all he does is steal from his people. Is that love? No, absolutely not. We're going to read the fruit of the Spirit in a minute, but another thing to look for in somebody is how do they treat others? Okay? Now, I'm not talking about, like, you, you got a good-looking girl that's, you know, got her eyes on a, a rich guy. I'm not talking about how she treats him. How does she treat the homeless beggar on the street corner that has almost nothing? How, does, how, does, how do they help people... How do they treat people that can do nothing for them? Think about that. Do they make fun of people behind their back? Do they mock their family when they don't like something? You know, do they mock their mother and father? You know, the Bible says to honor thy mother and father, that your days may be long upon the earth. I'm paraphrasing. But it does. It says honor thy mother and father. How do they treat their, their brothers and sisters? You know, but let's take a look. When you go to Galatians chapter 5, we could read the following, okay? The fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Didn't Jesus say about love? Love, the, love thy neighbor, love the Lord. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Why joy? Because you know you've been pulled out of the fire of hell by the grace of Jesus Christ. Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. People that have these things, they don't need to be Torah keepers. Because there is no law against them. Because they have loy, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Oh yeah, sounds like good advice to me. Um, sometimes I need to take my own advice. Oftentimes I need to take my own advice. Uh, let's see. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. For ye were sometime, uh, sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. It is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake, 
Thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. For then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. And that's applied to Paul's time then, just as it does now. The days are evil. Find somebody that's generous. Okay? I know a lot of people, they just live to accumulate money. I mean, they make their first million, then they want to make two. Then when they want to make two, they want to make ten. And then when they get ten, they want twenty. Then they want fifty and a hundred. They've got so much money. I know people that could spend a million dollars a day and never run out of money. I, you know, it's just that's what they live for, to accumulate money. You know, Elvis Presley, Elvis, the king, right? He he was a very, very generous person. I mean, I, I worked in uh, Memphis for a year. That's where he lived. And you could always talk to somebody that knew somebody that Elvis had helped. I mean, waitresses that would say that Elvis would come in and order a, you know, a $5 sandwich and leave a $100 tip for a waitress. Back when, you know, $100 was like three weeks pay for me. Um, my first job in high school in the early 70s. I mean, he was just like that. Um, he'd pull over. And, and somebody had a, a woman had a flat tire and she had a couple kids. He'd pull over, change the tire for her himself. And then look at, and, and oh, he, you know, you got all bald tires on this car. What's, you can't have tires like that with these kids in the car. You're going to have an accident. He'd flip open the wallet, pull out four or $500 bills and hand it to him. I mean, the guy was just, I mean, there, one time one of his maids was um, uh, late because her car had broken down or something. And, you know, it was an older car. He bought her a brand new car. He was anything but greedy. Now, you know, when you're a good-looking rich guy like Elvis was, you've got all these good-looking, gorgeous women just throwing themselves at you. Boy, I tell you what, I, you know, very, very difficult to say no for a guy. I mean, it's just, you know, that's what got Elvis in trouble. But his wife, Priscilla Presley, when Elvis died, she was complaining that the estate was worth less than a million dollars. She was complaining, oh, I've only got less than a million dollars in the bank. Oh, boy, oh. Well, it's worth a heck of a lot more money now. You know, it's just, it's just, uh, Elvis was anything but greedy. And uh, for those of you who don't know it, Elvis said that he felt the call to go into the ministry and serve Jesus Christ. But he knew that if he did, he would have lost probably 90% of his fan base. And he rejected it. And look how he died, you know. But I tell you what, he that he was anything but greedy. He was so kind. I I unbelievable. Turn to Luke chapter 14 and verse 12. Then said he, Jesus, then said he also to them that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, rather neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. In other words, you know, you you have a dinner party and you invite your neighbors. Well, guess what? Chances are your neighbors are going to have a dinner party and they're going to invite you. You know, what did you do? I mean, it, it's it's a scale. It balanced out. You know, you invited them. They invited you. You know. Verse 13, Jesus says, But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot recompense thee. They, they can't pay you back. They don't have anything. The homeless. A lot of people are homeless because of 
they they don't want to waste their money on rent. They want to do drugs. But there's also people, they're homeless because they've lost their jobs, bills, medical bills. Um, you know, there was a time I was homeless. I, uh, I did a radio show up in Tennessee, or no, Kentucky, that was heard in Kentucky and Tennessee. And uh, a few days later, it was on Halloween, Satanism and the Occult. A few days later, uh, my back gave out. I couldn't work. Company was self-insured. They said, well, you know, uh, we're not going to pay you. So I was like, I had no money saved up. Uh, the The only girl that ever really loved me had divorced me and because I cheated on her like a fool. I told you I'm an expert on doing things wrong. But um, she took a took. A, well, we basically basically lost everything. I've lost everything in my life twice. The Lord showed me it's just things, stuff. But when the Lord calls us home, He says there's um, He's going to go prepare a place for us. There's many mansions in His Father's kingdom. Well, the thing was, I was homeless. I had nothing, but I never went hungry. It's amazing. I had no money coming in, no job, but I, I never went hungry. Lord always provided. He got me out of that bad situation. But you know, a lot of homeless people are homeless because of no fault of their own. Uh, you know, the United States is not a blessed country anymore. A lot of the Jobs disappeared, went overseas. America's cursed. It's not blessed. I see signs and bumper stickers. God bless America. For what? For witchcraft, Harry Potter, abortion, sodomite marriage? No. No. Maybe they're asking Satan to bless America, but that ain't going to happen. When thou makest a feast... Call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. They can't pay you back. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Oh yeah. When the resurrection comes, when you hear the words from Jesus at the first resurrection, what's Jesus going to say? Well, these are the words you want to hear. Matthew 25 and verse 23. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. You definitely want to hear those words. You don't want to hear, uh, I never knew you, depart from me. You don't want to hear those words. So let's see. Let's go down a little bit. All right, let's go to Matthew 25 and down to 31, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, there's a difference between holy angels and unholy angels, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. You know, what's interesting is that word nations is the same word that they translate Gentiles in some places. Wouldn't that be interesting if they wrote, and before him shall be gathered all Gentiles. Ooh, but they didn't do that. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Isn't that funny that the uh, Church of Satan has the goat as their symbol? Isn't that interesting? I mean, really? Really? In your face, right? And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Have you ever heard of right-wingers? You know, the Christian right-wingers, conservatives? And then the left is the, you know, liberals and 
communists and socialists and yeah you know then then shall the king say unto them on his right hand this is what you want to hear come ye blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world this is jesus speaking now for i was an hungered and ye gave me meat i was thirsty and ye gave me drink i was a stranger and ye took me in naked and ye clothed me i was sick and ye visited me i was in prison and ye came unto me then shall the righteous answer him saying lord when saw we thee and hungered or fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee and when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee and the king shall answer and say unto them verily i say unto you inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren ye have done it unto me then shall he say also unto them on the left hand this is not what you want to hear depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels for i was in hunger and ye gave me no meat oh yeah you had money in the bank but you didn't want to spend it on uh anybody but yourself you know instead of buying a chevrolet you wanted a uh, a mercedes benz that's what you saved your money for you didn't feed the poor you didn't do nothing people for i was in hunger and you gave me meat i was thirsty and you gave me no drink you know what people let me tell you something one um in the 80s i was installing cable tv and i lived in south florida in the summer okay summer gets hot here 90s high 90s I've seen it 90 something degrees down here. I was working outside in Palm Beach. Um, you know, where people like Donald Trump live, the Kennedys, the Rockefellers, you know, rich, super rich people. I mean, pe these are people living on the beach. Guess what? Working in the summer outside on this guy's house or a woman's house, I don't remember now. And I asked them for a glass of water. You know what they told me? Oh, well, my maid doesn't come in for two more days. So use the hose. Use the hose. Yeah, use that hose outside that we use to water the, uh, the lawn. Really? Y y you can't give me a glass of water with a couple ice cubes in it? Really? Because your maid doesn't come for a couple days? Uh, you're afraid my dirty lips are going to be on the glass? Really? This is rich people. I mean, let's face it. You know, you can't give me a bottle, a bottle of cold water out of your refrigerator. You think these people are going to be in the kingdom? Uh, I don't know. For I was in hunger and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answered him, answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have that ye did it not, to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. You know, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt thou shalt be condemned oh yeah by you know we're supposed to do you know by words and deed in the book of colossians we read the following chapter 3 verse 17 
And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, that's your works, things that you do, and whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In other words, don't just, you know, be a politician. You promise everybody everything before the election time, and then after the election, you do the exact opposite of what everything that you said that you were going to do. I mean, I've been watching this since the 70s, people. I have no confidence in politicians. But let us not love in word, you know, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You know, the book of James is a very, very great book for practical living. Go to chapter 2. I, you know, I just don't get people that claim to be Christians and don't bother reading the Bible. But they can sure tell you what their sports team is doing. Oh, yeah, quarterback so-and-so, he... He threw for 935 yards, you know, and uh, 27 passes, and this and that and the other, and scored three running touchdowns, and or, you know, it's just unbelievable. James 2, 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy that have showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Oh, yeah, mercy. Very important. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? You know, a guy says he has faith and he's got $1,000 in his pocket and he sees a, a friend, an old friend of his that has no job and no money for food. You know, wouldn't you open up your wallet and give him some money to feed him, you know? And you call that faith? Verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. And then there's people who will tell you, oh, this is works-based salvation. No, what you do is proof of what you believe. Okay? I mean, if you're giving somebody something to earn your salvation, you've missed the point. But, I mean, there are people that will tell you that you can be a hit man for the mafia, believe in Jesus, murder people for your living, and you're going to go to heaven. There's people who teach that. Well, all you got to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus said by our words we would be justified and by our words we would be condemned. Our works are proof of what we believe. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Important. You know, Jesus said, Luke 14, 13, But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. You know, does... Does the, the person that you're considering to be a spouse, are they kind to those people that can do nothing for them? You know, just because when people are nice to people that can do things for them, that doesn't mean anything. But when people are kind to people that can't do anything for them, that can barely keep them help themselves, that's true kindness. That's the kind of person you ought to be looking for. That's the kind of person 
that will not betray you. There was a, a guy I knew. He had pretty much lost... Um, he was pretty well off. Had a girl. Had pretty much lost everything. And um, the girl left him. Oh, pfft. You know, I married you because you, you had something, and, and you don't have it anymore. I'm going to find me somebody else. Takes off. Well, one of his family members um, wanted to kind of teach him a lesson because he made a stupid investment um, kind of thing or something. I don't remember all the details. It's been a long, long time. But they let him suffer for a while, being poor for a while. And then after the girl had left... Um, they gave him some money so he could start over again. And then he was successful after that. And lo and behold, a couple years later, after he was successful, the girl comes, tries to come back. And she was good looking, trust me. But he says, uh, yeah, well, you know, um, yeah, if you just want to go out and play around, have some fun with me, uh, we could probably do that. But to marry you, I don't think so. Absolutely not. So, you know, what can I tell you? Uh, he wasn't, he was not a believer that I know of, but uh, I'm just saying that's, that's how that was. You know, he, uh, he had lost everything and was poor for a while and hey, she took off. There was no loyalty there. You know, you want somebody that's going to be loyal. That's going to, you know, when people do their marriage vows, it means nothing to most people. Oh, for richer, for poorer, for in sickness and in health, baloney. There was one guy, I didn't know him personally, but uh, he had a pretty good job working for an oil company, and he uh, violated some company procedures and created a, a fire, an explosion, and he got burned really bad, uh, was disfigured, was in the hospital for a long time. His wife dumped him, just took off. So, well, I don't want you anymore. And uh, it happens all the time. Ah, let me tell you a story. Uh, in high school, there was this girl. Oh, she was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I mean, you know, you're talking 17, 18-year-old girl. She's getting ready to graduate from high school. And she's engaged to be married to this uh, guy. Um, lived on the beach, you know, nice house, nice car. Family was pretty well-to-do. And uh, she was a nice girl. I, I kind of liked her, you know, not just because she was pretty, just, you know, she was nice. But she decided she wanted to be with this rich guy. I, I had nothing much to do with her. I just knew her through school. I wasn't anybody special with her or anything. But um, she was engaged to be married to this guy. And uh, I don't remember all the details, but I think drunk driver ran a red light and smashed into her. She wasn't wearing a seatbelt and she smashed her face into the windshield and it cracked. So she broke some bones in her face, scars. Um, she wasn't pretty that pretty anymore, you know. Guy comes to her, her fiance to be married to her, comes to her in the hospital and takes a look at her and and, uh, I mean, they had a wedding date set and everything. And he basically told her, it's, it's, it's off, you know. I mean, I don't want to marry somebody that looks like you now. You know, your face is all smashed up, scars. You know, the plastic surgeon can only do so much. You're not pretty anymore. I forget you, you know. And uh, she ended up marrying um, a guy that was a, a lot nicer to her, you know, somebody that she had known for a while. And, uh, you know, tell me, tell you, that's, it makes a difference, people. It really does. I'm sure, um, I never saw her again after I got out, left high school. I went in the army and, uh, very few people I kept in touch with, but, uh, I heard she had, uh, gone, gotten involved with somebody else that, uh, cared about her, not just her pretty face, so. All right, well, I hope you uh, learned something. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministry, signing off.
All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. That's Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen.